You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Where I'm from, uh, a little market town in Driffield, it's not very multicultural at all. Um, our next door neighbor had a black Labrador called Nigger. So that's the environment I was brought up in. Um, so I was fighting all the time, like I said, for self-preservation more than anything. I woke up one morning and um, I'll never forget, my dad said, your, your, your mum's gone. And I thought he meant he'd killed her. I honestly did, I thought my mum was dead. And I said, what do you mean? We played Liverpool in the Carling Cup final and I was cup tagged. I played for Sheffield United, United before, so I ended up going out all day. Ended up drunk and we ended up in a massive fight in um, in an Indian restaurant and got charged with a fray. My solicitor told me I was looking at 18 months. So he said, if you plead not guilty, you're going to get found guilty. He says, you'll get 18 months for this. So I'd already been arrested so many times. Tuesday night, actually, we played... We played Millwall on Sky Sports. We beat them 1-0 and I got man of the match. So I had no plans to go out and I thought, and I, like I said, I've not been, I've just got in the team. So I thought, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm back in the game. Let's go out and celebrate, have a few beers. So I've gone out in Beverly and this kid started on me and we went outside. Uh, no, I went outside to leave and him and his few of his mates ran outside and started. And this guy fucking started throwing punches at me, so. I hit him with one of the best shots I've ever thrown in my life. It made that, uh, that noise and I knocked him out and he ended up breaking his jaw in six places. So we had the Wednesday off. I turned up to training Thursday. As soon as I pulled in, there's a fucking cop car there. And you just know straight away, don't you, that it was for me. So I've got my gear on, slid out the back, got into the training ground. As I'm doing the warm up, Police have come, arrested me on the on the training ground. I feel real bad saying this, but losing my dad was the reason I won the British title, because it was a re it gave me a reason to carry on doing it. Because it was the last thing I ever said to my dad that I promised him that I'd do it. Boom, we're on. <laughs> we're Today's on. Guess we can cut this with toast. <laughs> How are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Yeah. Thanks for coming on today. My pleasure. It's been a long time in the making. Yeah, hasn't it? definitely. Great story, mate. Premiership footballer, turned boxing, turned manager. You've had a up and down life, basically, mm. in prisons, charges everywhere, but also a phenomenal career from a young kid, 17. I think you're the youngest ever to captain. Was it Sheffield United? I was, yeah. Still a record that stands yeah, today. Yeah, played for England under 21s, um, million pound signing on fees. It's a bit of a career, man. Like yeah. retiring early, it's, um, all over the place. Definitely, yeah. All over the place is probably the right word. And, you know, I am one of them. I, I even now, I'm 41 now, and I was thinking to myself sometimes, God, I wonder what I'm going to do when I get older. I've kind of got that personality. I'm mm. always drifting from thing to thing. But sometimes it's, um, it's, it's hard sometimes having so much success at such a young age when you don't really know how to deal with it. And that's what happened with me um, yeah. football. If I'd had my time again, I'd probably retired a lot earlier. I retired at 26, but I was probably done by the time I was 22. Um, yeah. I didn't really know what else to do. The only other thing that I was all right at was fighting. So I thought, instead of getting locked up all the time for it, I might as well try and make mm -hmm. a few quid. So yes. I went into boxing then quickly realised I'm not actually very good at fighting. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. You've had, you said you had over 100 fights on the streets before mm. you went and turned pro, which is um, pretty mad considering you, the reputation you had on the football field and try to, people look at footballers and think they've kind of got to stay level-headed, but you were in papers and doing your thing. and Yeah, and I think, listen, a lot, a lot of them were self-preservation, you know, my fights. And I say I had 100 fights, you know, Makes me sound really hard, but I probably lost 95 of them. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? I'm five foot six now. So as a kid, I was always real small. And that's so where I'm from, uh, a little market town in Driffield. It's not very multicultural at all. Um, our next door neighbor had a black Labrador called Nigger. So that's the environment I was brought up in. Um, so I was fighting all the time, like I said, for self-preservation more than anything. You know, I used to run home crying all the time. And my dad used to say to me, listen, if you don't do anything about it, you're going to be running back here crying until you a grown man, you know, get out there and, and defend yourself type of thing. So the first time I actually hit somebody back, 
it, it felt good. It felt quite liberating. And what I realized at a young age is people don't actually like fighting. People don't like confrontation. So if you, you don't even need to be able to fight, just look like you can fight. You know, I always say to the kids that come to my boxing classes, if, if someone starts a fight and you get in your boxing stance and say to them, come on then. And that person thinks, oh shit, this kid knows what he's doing a little bit. And 95, 97% of people will think, I'll leave that one alone. Because people don't like the confrontation of it. So as soon as I started trying to defend myself and fighting back, people had stopped calling me the names. So I kind of took that into later life. You know, um, if anyone wanted to argue or have a fight with me, I was always willing to participate. At this time, I'm a professional footballer. So whenever you're getting into trouble, it ends up in the newspapers. And, you know, I, I love the saying that the youth is wasted on the young. And that's definitely uh, the situation with me. I made so many stupid mistakes as a young boy that I wouldn't as a 17 year old kid I wouldn't do as a 41 year old man but we all do that don't we yeah but we all make mistakes brother we're all, mm. we're all young at once and some just make more mistakes than others some don't yeah. learn some do learn I always go back to the start for my guest Curtis where you grew up and how it all began yeah well I'm from a, a market town like say about half an hour from uh, from here uh, called uh, called Driffield so my dad was born in 1956 so if you actually look at my dad's birth certificate, his name is Bernardo's Chufik Woodhouse. So he was adopted by Bernardo's at birth. His, uh, his birth mum came over here to England, uh, pregnant, had the kids over here, and then she disappeared back to Jamaica. So my dad was raised um, by my nana over in Bridlington and, uh, and uh, with, with my dad's twin brother, who's my uncle Carson. My nana's an, a, a remarkable woman. I could do the whole podcast about her. You know, she she raised three b black kids, uh, my dad and his brother, my auntie Mandy, in a, in an area where there's no black people for maybe 50 miles. You know, she's got pictures um, that I've seen that spray paint on her door, nigger lover and all things like that, brutal. People used to spit at her in the street. Um, and she was in a house of uh, real bad domestic violence. So she actually sent um, my dad and his brother back to Bernardo's for a few months until she got away from the relationship which she was in. And um, and once she was out of that relationship, went back to go and get them, which I find remarkable. And raised my um, my dad and my uncle Carson and my auntie Mandy. And, uh, and then later on, they moved to Driffield. My dad then met my mum. My dad was out one night and uh, there was a massive fight and someone punched my dad, so... This woman went over to my dad and says, oh, are you okay, love? And he said, of course I am, you stupid cow. And that was my first thing my dad ever said to my mum. <laughs> and then my dad seen my mum the week after in the pub. Because at that time, pubs were open every day. They were open Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, I think, in Driffield. And the week after, my dad was out with his mates. And one of his mates said, hey, it's that bird over there with the big tits. And that ended up being my mum. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, that's yeah. how my mum and dad met. And then I came along, and my brother and sister, and... I was raised in Driffield, yeah, and um, I loved it. You know, when I talk about my childhood sometimes, it, it sounds pretty brutal, but I loved my childhood. It was amazing. Um, like I said, we had a next-door neighbour but one who had a black Labrador called nigger, but we were all friends. You know, that was just a word that was used in them days, and you either go home and cry about it or you deal with it there and then. So we were always fighting amongst each other. Um, my house was a scary place to be brought up in. Um, Why? because my mum and dad would fight a lot. Um, and a, a lot of my early problems came from dealing with that situation. You know, I, I remember still now some of my earliest memories I sat up at the top of my stairs and we were born in a, a raised place called Northfield Crescent. My mum and dad would be fighting downstairs, windows would be going through, everything would be smashing. And I was petrified. And I, as, a, as the eldest child, I felt like my job is to look after my brother and sister. And that feeling of pure frozen with fear it's something that still now I got a shiver down my spine when I talk about because I remember it like it was yesterday. And not being able to defend my family, I found really uh, uncomfortable. It took me ages to kind of deal with it, the process of talking about it. And, and, and I hadn't spoke about this until probably a couple of years ago. So it's something that I, was, that I bottled up for ages. Um, and it's difficult because my dad's no longer here, you know, and I didn't have a great relationship with my mum growing up. We were brilliant now, we get on great. So it was all really a difficult process for me to, to come through, but... Yeah, there was a lot of domestic violence in in, in my house uh, growing up, and that was hard and scary. For I think it affects men in uh, in. I don't listen. I can't speak for for women. I'm not a woman, but I think it's quite um, demasculating for a man. I don't know if you know if that's a word, but it takes away that. I'm I'm, a, I'm an old school 
bloke. You know, I feel my job is to protect, provide. You know, that's my job as a man. So as a young kid, to not be able to help was, was tough. And uh, yeah, a lot of my early memories are of that. And that was tough. So that was kind of what I was brought up in. Uh, my mum and dad split up when I was 14 years of age. How was that for you? Yeah, difficult. I woke up one morning and um, I'll never forget. My dad said, your, your, your mum's gone. And I thought he meant he'd killed her. I honestly did. I thought my mum was dead. And I said, what do you mean? He says, hey, she's gone. She moved away and she, she'd she um, gone with my brother and sister. So this was 1994. There's no mobile phones at this point. So when someone leaves and goes to a, like another town an hour away or an hour and a half away, whatever it is, I had no contact with my brother or sister or my mum. So I didn't know where they were. I didn't know what was happening. And that was difficult. My dad used to work away in London Monday to Fridays. So on Sunday night, he used to travel up. <clears throat> So I'm in the house at 14 on my own, 14 to probably 15, 16, on my own Monday to Friday. And my dad would come home on a weekend and he used to work on the doors on a weekend. So I was kind of, I raised myself for a couple of years. Um, I used to go around to my next door neighbour, but ones at the time called Kevin Edgar, who later died of a drug overdose. And we just used to doss about, stop going to school. So I left school really at 14 and was just kind of living on my own. So that was my upbringing. Um, you know, I know a lot of people say sport saved them, but I was very, very fortunate that throughout all of this, one thing that I was always constant in my life was football. And I was always really good. Um, so that kind of got me away from the situation. I moved over to Sheffield at 16 years of age um, and did an apprenticeship at Sheffield United where I was earning £42.50 a week. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was amazing. And from 16 to 18 were probably the best two years of my life looking back. Is that when you felt alive, free? Chasing a dream. Yeah. You know, I always say to everybody that the, the journey is so much better than the destination. You know, all the stuff you're going through. So there's a group of 30 lads there. We all want to be footballers. Like I say, we're earning £42.50 a week. It's about nothing but chasing that dream. So them two years were so good. And within that first year, I'd, I'd made my debut for the first team, which was amazing. And I signed my first big contract. And then something that came into my life changed a lot of things which was money i'd never had money never experienced money didn't have a clue about it i don't know if you you guys have it up in scotland but we used to put um a pound coin in the back of the television yeah. and you used to get four hours yeah. electricity so that's kind of what we used to do and when i signed my first contract at sheffield united i was having all this money come out of my bank account and didn't have a clue what was going what on what were you getting when you signed um the first deal i signed at sheffield united was on 1800 pound a week and then I got, um, I, I played and got in the team, started playing regularly, and my money went up to three grand. I'm only 17 at the time. So that was a bit mind blowing. And um, and I remember ringing Kevin McCabe, who was the chairman at the time, like saying, I, someone's hacked my bank account. I've got all this money, like people taking money out of my account. I don't know, I've got no idea where it's going. Um, so he rang the police and we had a meeting at, at, at Sheffield United and said, bring your bank statements in, your passport and all that. So I took it in. So the coppers are looking at it, and they're looking at me like I'm an idiot. And they're like, w we don't understand what you're saying. I'm so like, I've got, look, that thousand pounds gone out there. And they're like, they direct debits. And I'm like, what's a direct? I didn't have a clue mm -hmm. what any of it was. And it was really, really difficult to deal with money. Talking about it now is embarrassing, but that's, that was my reality. Um, did no ever take you aside and try and get money management skills or no for the to play in front of 30, 40,000 people each week? No, if you just got to be learn how to deal with it, especially with you talking about the trauma of the past as well, it's obviously going to affect you because you've probably been used to your life full of chaos, yeah, anger, frustration to then being in a friendlier environment, making some money legit. Yeah, it's an extra pressure that you think, fuck this, I'm actually used to being in chaos, yeah, and um. I remember when I first signed my first contract, I think I got signed on fee of £100,000 spread over four years, so 25 grand each year. So all of a sudden, I've gone for £42.50 a week, and then I get a bank statement, all of a sudden there's like thousands of pounds in there. And there's was, there was none of like, listen, spend it on this, spend it on that. All I'm thinking straight away is clothes, women, fast cars, you know, all the stuff that you dream of as a as a young kid when you're from a council estate and you've never had nothing. I remember when I first went to Sheffield United, I didn't own a pair of trainers. I had no trainers, so I turned up in a tracksuit and shoes. So my first pay packet, I bought a brand new pair of trainers and just little things like that, that I'd never had. So then all of a sudden, when you've got all this money, 
it blew my mind a little bit. And when I was 16, I, I got um, I got put on um, anxiety tablets by Sheffield United when I was 16. So Did they see signs of yeah, you being quite yeah. all over the place? Yeah. So I, I went to the, the, the club doctor who put me on um, like tablets, but they were no good for me. And at the time, I always liked to drink anyway. It was normal. But they used to make me quite drowsy. So people just thought I was pissed all the time when I wasn't. I was just struggling a little bit. But these, it helped me sleep. It helped me settle down. Sleeping's always been a massive, massive issue for me. Because I panic in situations. I have really bad nightmares still to this day. Do you think that's because of the domestic violence that was in the house? Yeah, it is. Yeah, because it's just not being able to settle. Because I used to sit up, like, praying, thinking, fucking hell, what's going to happen tonight? Is everything going to be all right? Was your mum and dad drinkers? Yeah. Yeah. So they both come in. Steaming. Yeah. And then sometimes it'd be all right and I could sleep. Sometimes it'd be carnage. You know, I love my dad. My dad's my hero. He took me all over the country with my football and I'm a real daddy's boy. But dad's also the scariest man I've ever been around in my life. How was he when you signed for Sheffield United? Yeah, he was buzzing. We went all over the country, mm-hmm. trials everywhere, um, trying to trying to make something of my life really. And whenever we had no money, we'd beg, steal and borrow for a tenner to get you know, if we had ten pound left, that ten pound would go in the car, so we could get to a trial. Um, so my dad used to sacrifice everything to get me there. That's you know, my dad was, was without my dad, I wouldn't have been successful in football because, like I said, he sacrificed everything. I love my dad, and you know, like I said, he's my hero. He's also scary. You know, when my dad loses his temper, he's a really, really scary man. Um, so that was that was hard. Um, so yeah, I, I, I struggled like mad with it, and it was a long, long process of trying to get over it. Yeah. Still, now I have real bad nightmares. Now, I'm 41 years of age, so it's something I'm never gonna um, get over. You just have to learn to live mm-hmm. with it, really. What but about, it shaped my yeah, whole life, yeah. you know. And it's so important. Yeah. Like I, I do a lot of work with schools now, and um, a lot of a lot of schools, you know, they, they have kids that are maybe not too naughty kids, and I know it's not the kids; it's what they're going back home to. You know, we have a massive responsibility as parents to do better. Mm-hmm. What about when, how long were you on the anxiety pills for? What were they, Valium or anything? What were the kind of know, tablets? I don't know what the exact word from were. Um, two years. Did you feel, a, did it make a difference on the field as well? We tired more, Just less energy? They help you sleep and settle down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How was it when you says phases of 16, 18 was the best years of your life? Because Why is I, that? Because I was around loads of mates that were chasing the same dream. Mm-hmm. And I'm out of, bearing in mind that from 14 to 16, I lived on my own. I'm a kid, you know, I didn't even know. I, I, my dad used to live like uh, chicken legs in the freezer with a deep fat fryer. So I used to bang a chicken leg into it like five minutes, fry it, stick some rice with it. And that's what I did. I'm a kid. I didn't, um, I didn't know what I was doing. So from 16 to 18, I lived in digs with a lady called Rita. And um, there's like seven or eight of us in there. So I've got my own little family again. You know, I've got people, I've got Rita who's cooking my meals for me. Um, she was married to a Turkish guy called Ersan, who's a wicked cook. He saw all like the Turkish food and everything. So all of a sudden I've gone from absolute carnage. And they had a massive house as well and a real like posh part of Sheffield. I'm like, you know, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. I used to actually nick wheel trims from Millhouse's Lane. Um, all really big cars up there. So as soon as I moved into this house, I'm like, Fucking, I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. There's loads I can nick here. <laughs> so we, we used to go up Millhouse's Lane and steal wheel trims. And when I got into the first team, I'm nicking wheel trims. You know, so people are walking past and thinking, is that Curtis Woodhouse with <laughs> a fucking wheel trim mm-hmm. under his arm? But that was just the environment we were in. It was a buzz. I loved it. You know, it wasn't about the the money. It was about whether I could get that off that Jaguar or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So I loved them two years because it was before I'd made it as well as a footballer. You know, I was earning good dough, but it's before no one knew who I was. So I could go anywhere. I'm in a big city. It was amazing. The best two years. I it, I felt like I was it, like probably like how people feel like when they're in university or whatever. Mm. Were you drinking heavy at 16, 17, yeah. 18? Yeah, How definitely. much? No more than anybody else who was playing football at that age. So we'd have like a Tuesday night. It used to be student night. We always used to have Wednesday off. So we were out Tuesday. We were out Saturday, Sunday. Probably four, four out of the seven days. That's a lot, though. Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then on Thursdays, I was one of them. I could never. St- I could. I, I have to take everything to extremes. So some of the lads would go out after the game on Saturday, which was normal. But then I'd have to then go out Sunday. You know, Monday I'd be a bit ropey, so then I'd be out all day Tuesday, 
Wednesday we had the day off, so sometimes I go out Wednesday. And you're never allowed to drink 48 hours before a game, so Thursday was a no-go. So me being like fucking cleverest guy around, thinking, well, I'll go to Chesterfield on a Thursday. It's like five miles away from Sheffield. You know, it's not as if I'm going to the other end of the country. Mm. So I used to go out in Chesterfield, a place called Zanzibar's on a Thursday, sober up Friday, play Saturday. So that was my routine from probably 17 to 25. Do you ever look back and think if you'd fully dedicated yourself to your craft, how far you would have went? All the time. But I've stopped playing that game now because I've kind of accepted that no matter what I'd done as a young kid, would have ended up the same because I just wasn't emotionally um, ready to deal with the pressures of being successful. Being successful, you have to do a lot of things to do it. You have to be dedicated. You have to get into a good, healthy routine. You have to live a correct life. I just no way. I wasn't. I wasn't uh, mature enough to do that. So no matter what I'd have done, it'd have crashed and burned whether it be football, whether it be working in a bank, whether it be in this or that. So I've stopped playing that game really, but obviously sometimes I watch TV and think, I wonder what I could have done. Yeah. And there's no worse feeling than mm -hmm. that. And that's why I had to stop playing that game. Why well, you just beat yourself up, don't you? What age did you get a call up for England, 21s? Well, I played for England under 16s, under 18s, under 21s. So I went right through the age groups. So I, I, I genuinely thought, I had a chance to go to the World Cup for Jamaica, um, but I genuinely thought I was going to play for England um, you know, some of the players that I played with, I was on level par with that went on to go and get loads of caps. Who so, was there at the ones with you? So people like um, Frank Lampard, who was obviously a good player, but wasn't a standout, you know what I mean? Jamie Carragher, um, Seth Johnson, Paul Robinson, who was from the area that I was from, just loads of like really good players, Joe Cole, mm -hmm. some amazing players. So that was kind of my, my era, Steven Gerrard, um, all of the good ones, really. What was their dedication like? Seeing you were playing for under twenty ones and them, did were them? Were you still sneaking away and getting a drink, or were they head down because they seem focused? Gerrard's carriers, they seem football, football, football. Yeah, well, I think the era that I came into it. So I came in at ninety six. So the the it was the norm to go out, and I, and I've I've seen a few interviews with Stephen Gerrard where he talks about. I think it was Gerard Hulia came into the football club and stopped all of that. Whereas I never had anybody do that. I never had that kind of positive influence on on my football clubs. Probably because they're at Liverpool. I'm at Sheffield United. The, the, there's a difference. You can't play for Liverpool and be doing what I'm doing. Whereas, I know this sounds ridiculously arrogant, whereas I could play for Sheffield United and get away with it being half cut because my ability had take me through. Um, but you can't get away with that. So, I, I, I know they had a cut-off point. Like I said to you a minute ago, I've... I've Never had a cut-off point. My cut-off point had always as a young kid would be when I ran out of money. When you're on three grand a week, you're not running out of money anytime soon. So you don't really have a cut-off point. Yeah, was there ever drugs involved? No, I've never I've never been one to take drugs, smoke weed and stuff like that. I actually smoked weed on a on a pre-season tour with Sheffield United. There's four or five <laughs> you're of not us. Tripping balls. Yeah, there's four or five of us sat on a beach in there, Trinidad and Tobago. Split about that yeah. big. So that was uh, yeah, that was interesting. But uh, drugs has never really been mm -hmm. a thing for me. When did you go to Birmingham? 2001. And that was for a million quid? Yeah, I was 21 at the time, yeah. Still young, big signing fee. Young. Very young. Very young. What was it like leaving Sheffield United? I was happy to leave. Why? Because I was just in a terrible routine, like I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. But there Saturday, all day Sunday, Monday sober up, all day Tuesday. I'm off Wednesday, so probably all day Wednesday. Sneak off to Chesterfield on Thursday, Friday sober up, Saturday play do it all over again. So I thought, I need to get out of this horrendous routine that I'm in. So I moved to Birmingham City, which was just as bad. Ended up on more money in a bigger city. So it was just like more, you know, more problems. More money, more problems. Yeah. You know Did I mean? you ever look to speak to anybody? Like to say, like, I'm really battling here. There's something not right. As like, I'm constantly waking up, feeling down. So that's a, like a bit of depression, anxiety. Yeah. There was another a time where you, no, nobody spoke out at those times. It's not no. like now where people's kind of speaks out all the time. It's easy for people to speak out, but did you not realise that, okay, I need someone to talk to or did you just try and hide it with? When I look back now, I've probably suffered a lot more than what I realised. As, as an old man now looking, old man, I'm only 41, <laughs> but, but looking back, you see all the signs. But I'm, I, I didn't know and... 
football clubs, maybe different now, but football clubs don't care what happens if you're performing on a Saturday. They're not really interested in what you do away from that. There's no liaison officer or anything like that or, or no one kind of to speak to. And even if there was, I wouldn't have done it anyway because I was, like say, I'm old school. I'm not, I'm, only recently have I felt comfortable to talk about how I feel, you know, the situation sometimes that I feel in. You know, sometimes I have three days where I just can't get out of bed, I just can't do it, but I just know how to deal with it now. You know, whereas before, it was mad. You know, I'd be on, I'd, I'd sometimes ring my dad like in tears and say, what's up? I say, I just, I just, I don't know. I just, I don't want to be here, dad. I want to come home. I don't want to play football anymore, you know. And I'm old school. My dad's like even older, older school. So he'd be like, fucking hell. He said, I'm working on a building site here, getting paid 300 quid a week. You're fucking up in Birmingham on 15 grand a week. Grow up type of thing. So that, but that was, it's not his fault. He doesn't know any better. And and I didn't know any better. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking, yeah, he's right. You know what I mean? Okay, let's go for a beer. I'll feel better with a few beers, don't we? So that's kind of the whole cycle. And it just got worse and worse and worse. What kind of age, what age were you when it really started to take its toll when you get start getting not as fit as you were and the beers and the drink, it starts really hitting its toll where the fitness starts to go a bit. Probably 22. Like I say, if I had my time again, I'd have probably jacked at 22. Um, maybe even had a year away from football just to, I don't know, just to get out the 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 whole, um, the cycle of it all really. But I was putting on loads of weight. I, I drink lager. So, you know, it put there's a lot of calories in it. Yeah. So, and my game was getting around the pitch. I was always quite quick. I was strong. I was fit. I could run all day. I'd tackle for you. I was kind of an old school boxer box midfielder. But what underpinned all that was my cardiovascular system. I was fit. I could run all day for you. But once that starts becoming, go from elite to bang average, then my game takes a massive, massive dip. Um, and that's what happened. And I was no longer the player that I used to be. So then that that kicks in them feelings of like, disgust with yourself. What the fuck has happened here? You know, and then before I know it, I'm dropping through the leagues, you know, and I'm, 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 I don't want this to sound disrespectful, but I know it does. And I fucking ended up at, like playing in League Two on a Tuesday night at Leighton Orient, where there's like fucking 1,500 people there. And I'm thinking, how, what has happened? How have I got to this? And it took me a long time, you know, I blame everyone, every manager I ever played for, I hated. And then after a bit, you kind of realise that I was un unmanageable and uncoachable. And that was a big issue that, that I had. And once I kind of got through all of that and moved on to a different sport in boxing, it was easy because I learned how to, mm -hmm. I learned how to handle that. But I was, I was unmanageable, uncoachable. But the best thing I ever did was, I, I've managed to bounce back from that. How many players do you know at a young age crash and burn and never, ever come back from it? And, and I managed to find something else and fall in love with something else and find a way back to living a, a healthy life and, and, and being a positive impact on other people's lives, which for a long time I never thought I would be. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up getting over like, 20 charges, or different arrests? And what was the one in the cup final you missed, but you ended up smashing up the Indians? Yeah, we, we played Liverpool in the Carling Cup final. And I was cup tags. I played for Sheffield, Sheffield United, United before, so... I ended up going out all day, ended up drunk, and we ended up in a massive fight in um, in an Indian restaurant and got charged with a fray. My solicitor told me I was looking at 18 months. So he said, if you plead not guilty, you're going to get found guilty. He says, you'll get 18 months for this. So I'd already been arrested so many times. I've never been arrested sober in my life, ever. Always when I'm pissed. Um, and that was, a. I think I I think I'd just had my first son as well. He's 18 next week, he's a big lad. Um, Shout out, happy birthday, yeah, what's happy his birthday. name? Yeah, happy birthday, he's called Kyle. Happy birthday, Kyle. Yeah, a little shit here. <laughs> Just let his dad do Yeah, I, I actually <laughs> sparred him a couple of weeks ago. He fucking dropped me with a body shot. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. So whenever I tell him, like, go do yeah. the dishes, he's like, you go do the fucking dishes. <laughs> so yeah, there's a new sheriff in yeah. town now. But yeah, he's 18. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I nearly went to jail then, very close. And um, when I when I went to court, my solicitor told me, "Listen, take a take a wash bag and bag on what you're kind of going to go to prison." And I was like, "Fucking hell!" But luckily, the judge was lenient because he probably seen this kid's got a, could have a bright future ahead of him. Yeah, we send him to jail. You know, it might disrupt all of that. So yeah, I got I got another opportunity. 
did that not, not give you the kick up the ass to say, okay, I need to knuckle down here. My life is slipping fast. What age were you then? 21. So still a young kid was all this shit in the press, all over the press. Oh, yeah, yeah. How yeah. was that extra pressure as well on your head? Hard, because you kind of, I've got a reputation now as a wrong one, you know, because I'd always, I'd always had loads of, been in loads of trouble at, at Chef United. A lot of it is laughed off when you're 17, 18, and just got into the team, and then starting to become the best player in the team. It's all like we spoke about before we came on air, a lot of it's brushed under the carpet because you're a commodity. We'll probably sell him on. I said I, I agreed a deal with Glasgow Rangers for four million pound. So no one's kind of like pulling you up on anything because you're a commodity. That's the way they see you, just a piece of meat, really. But then as you become less and less of a commodity, the um, people start pulling you up and people start finding you. People start wanting to sell you and get you out the football club when yeah. you're not a commodity anymore. And at that time, no longer a commodity mm -hmm. at, at Birmingham City. So when I did, ended up getting sacked. Yeah. When did Rangers come in for you? When I was eight, 18 or 19, that's sort of been, I think it was 1998, Dick Advocat, who was a manager. Great manager, man. Yeah, he great had some manager. Players, I think Newman, Van Bronckhorst, yeah. Gattusos and Alberts, I think they had some team then. Great era. Um, and I went up, I went up to, um, I went up to Glasgow to meet the, the chairman. I was actually on the back of the Scottish Sun. Um, the headline was Kirk Court in the Act. So Glasgow Rangers agree a four million pound fee for Sheffield United's Curtis Woodhouse. Um, so yeah, that's one of them sliding doors moment, isn't it? You know of what what might have happened if I'd have gone to if I'd have gone to Glasgow. Is that what it was? Four million. Four million quid. Yeah, in nineteen ninety eight. So well, you know, in the Versace Centre, strippers, booze, hotels. It was that's madness. classic Glasgow. Mate. Oh, the, the, God. The, the, well, I went. I went to the game. I think a lot of people in England don't understand how big Glasgow Rangers is. Massive. And Both Celtic, clubs, they yeah. don't realise how big the massive, clubs are. Yeah. And I was like, I'm an 18-year-old kid, big Gaza fan. So it was a season Gaza just left and obviously Gaza ripped the league apart. So I've gone down there and I'm thinking, like Sheffield United are a big club. I've gone to Glasgow Rangers and I couldn't believe it. It was the day that I think they beat Hearts, but they'd already won the, they'd already won the league. So they were parading the, um, the trophy around the ground. The place was rammed. The atmosphere was like, unbelievable um so i've gone into like took me into the trophy cabinet <laughs> in like the trophy room it's fucking bigger than my house there's, there's really about a thousand <laughs> trophies in there i mean chef united i think they've got like one trophy or something <laughs> like that so i couldn't believe it so i went i went round and they were shaking my hand like, like welcome to glasgow rangers i just needed to sign the deal it was all agreed like a four-year deal and i'm really looking forward to it so after the game gone back to the hotel and uh I was down there with a couple of agents as well, and Glasgow had, Rangers had sent like a couple of chaperones to take me around the city. They took me to, I went into the Versace shop. I don't really know Glasgow, but that yeah, well. Yeah, Italian centre. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. they took me around there and said, get whatever you want. And I got like a black pair of trousers. I didn't, I didn't get anything else. Um, so anyway, we went out on the on the night into Glasgow to kind of celebrate. I had a couple of beers before I know it. Like a couple of beers has turned into like drinking champagne. I'm drinking shots. And at this point, like when I left the ground, we went to, there's a pub opposite. The whole thing's blue and it's got massive paintings of all the old players in. So there's like loads of Rangers fans in there. So they're all like, oh, we can't wait to get you to Glasgow Rangers. What are you doing after? I said, oh, I'm, I'm going out in Glasgow. We'll come with you. So at this point, I'm in Glasgow in this bar with about 50 Rangers fans. And we're just going around from place to place. And we end up at, I'm sure the place is called the Piano Bar. Is that a place? Yeah. A bar, a piano, piano bar. It's like a real like swanky bar, really mm -hmm. like nice. By this point, it's like 10 o'clock, I'm pissed. So a guy's like playing the piano, singing a little bit of uh, yeah. a few love songs, you know yeah. what I mean? That would have been in Victoria's art, the Corinthian yeah. the piano bar. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. like an amazing yeah. place, I'm bollocks at this point. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, give us, give us a, another one. So they get like, everyone, shh, I'm like, fuck it. So I've, I've gone and grabbed the mic off him at this point, like shoved him out of the way. I'm stick, I'm on the piano singing fucking Mustang Sally <laughs> with about 50 uh, Glasgow uh, Rangers uh, fans behind me. The place is absolute carnage. We've gone from there to the strip club. And uh, I think it was like two o'clock, everyone was leaving. So we took all these women back to the back to the hotel. There was more strippers in my hotel than there was in the, <laughs> than there was in the strip bar. And we had like a massive suite there and we just wrecked the place. Ended up running, I think it was about six and a half grand bar bill just at the hotel. I must say Dick Advoc I'm out I'm out with two uh, Glasgow Rangers chaperones as well. So they must be looking, I'm thinking, who is this maniac we've got here? So I've gone back to Sheffield, I've gone back to England on the Sunday 
gone in to see the chef. I've got, I've got, uh, I've got, I've gone in at like nine o'clock. So I've got a message. Chairman wants to see you. So I'm thinking, so I've gone, I've only gone in to say bye to the lads, pick my boots up and say, oh lads, all the deal's done. Listen, see you later type of thing. Chairman wants to see you. So I'm thinking, like, obviously wants to say goodbye. So I've walked into his room and you know when you see someone's face and you fucking know something isn't right. And he said to me, he said, what have you done? I'm like, what do you mean? He said, what have you done this weekend? And I'm like, well, I went to the game and then went out for a few beers after. Few fucking beers. You've cost the football club four million pounds and all the deal had all fallen through. I don't think it was just that. I think there was other things, agents and all things like that. But yeah, I think in singing Mustang Sally in the piano bar on top mm-hmm. of the piano. I don't I don't think it helped. That didn't fill the strippers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was it was an expensive uh-huh. weekend, definitely. But I always think like what might have happened. It'd have probably been a bad move for me at that point. Because I'd have been on crazy amounts of money in a big city like Glasgow. Um yeah. Yeah. I, I was don't there think, one weekend yeah. and nearly wrecked yeah. the place. So <laughs> I don't think with your mindset back then no matter what team you'd have went with, no matter yeah. what manager, even if a manager tried to help you, you'd have probably told them to fuck off. Yeah. I think you'd have just spiralled anyway. But it's not until late. But again, you're still here to tell the tale and you've had mm. a phenomenal career. And anyone would, any footballer would do, do anything to have half your career yeah. for what you've achieved. So you went from Sheffield United, Birmingham. What was it after that? When well, I got sacked from Birmingham City. What for? Um, I went on a 44-day bender. As you do. Which is impressive, mm-hmm. you know. To wake up every day for 44 days and think, fuck it, I'm going again. Is <laughs> You know, it was crazy, really. And Steve Bruce rang me up one time. I was in Tenerife. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm in Tenerife. He was like, you've fucking been gone three weeks. What, what is going on? When are you coming back? And I was like, I don't know. My head had, my head had gone at this point. Absolutely gone. You ever saw a Saido then? No. No, never yeah. felt like that. Just my head had gone. I just didn't mm-hmm. want to be in that environment anymore. So I ended up getting, I got sacked from Birmingham City. Um, I said I had like two years left on my deal. Um, it just shows you because you're not a commodity, they just want you off the wage bill. But if I'd have been worth money to them, they'd have somehow found a way to get me. I'm not blaming Birmingham City, you know, totally my fault. You can't go on a 44 day bender during a season. So I, I totally get all that. Um, but I got sacked. Um, and then I ended up going to Peterborough United, which changed my life. Because um, that's when I met Gary Daru, who was a former um, British featherweight champion mm-hmm. or super featherweight, I'm not sure. How old were you? 24. Still young. Yeah. Still fucking it's crazy, young. It's as it? if you're at the end of your career at yeah. 35, 36. Yeah. But you're only 24. I'm 24. Bonkers. And I was getting into trouble at Peterborough United. That's how it all started. I'd, 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 uh, I'd flare up during training and just want to argue with everyone. We, we, Bobby Gould was the assistant manager. Remember Bobby Gould, who managed Wimbledon when they won the yeah. FA Cup? You know, been in the game for ages. Respectable fella. I spoke to him like shit all the time. So disrespectful. Looking back now, it's one of the worst things that I feel more guilty about than anything. He deserves so much more respect. And I just, I, I was a night... Talk about unmanageable. At that point, Peterborough United, I was probably the worst I've ever been. I'd just cause fights every day in training just because I could, because I wanted to. And if anyone tried to stop me, I'd just, I'd kick off, wreck the place, just boot balls off the training ground. When you look back, like I said, you know, if I'd have been older and more mature, I can understand there that that kid's got an issue. You're he, not captain there as well? Yeah, I was captain. So yeah. that's not a very good leader, the negativity no. impact. So I won player of the year. Mm-hmm. I won player of the year, fans player of the year, players player of the year. I know it sounds arrogant. I could do all that and still perform. We're in League One at this point. Fucking League One. I could play in League One now. Well, maybe not now. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to get in the Vets uh-huh. team at the minute, to be fair. Mm-hmm. But I know that sounds arrogant, but I, I could get away with it. League One was like fucking easy for me. I play with my eyes closed. So I could get away with doing whatever I wanted and still be good enough to, like you said, be captain. And I'm, I'm a terrible captain, awful leader at that point because I couldn't even control myself. So then you're trying to inspire other people around you with all these frustrations going on. And uh, and Barry Fry saved me really. He ran at this point. I'm I'm a, I'm volatile. I must be a nightmare to be around. I'm a ticking time bomb. So Barry Fry ran Gary Daru up, who had a who had a boxing gym in Peterborough. And said, we've got a player, um, can you help, help um, us with him? 
is a fucking nightmare. He said, we can't do nothing with him, won't listen to anybody. He quite likes his boxing. At the time, I had Leon McKenzie playing for us as well, who ended up being a boxer. Boxer as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if it kicked off in a game, we were fine, you know what I mean? Mm. So Barry rang Gary Daru, and Gaz said, yeah, bring him down to the gym one day. And Gary was just what I needed, you know, tough bloke, former British champion, wouldn't take any of my shit for starters. And I looked up to Gary, um, and he took me under his wing a little bit, showed me a bit of care and attention, understood me a little bit, and we clicked. So I started just doing little things on the pads, bit of footwork, just to knock a bit of steam off, really, to try and settle me down on the on the training on the training pitch. And that's where my professional boxing career started. That's when the the thing in my head thought, I really like this, and I've always liked fighting. Took me a long time to admit I like fighting. I enjoy it, mm -hmm. but when you say it out loud, it's like, oh, sounds a little bit brutal, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Love yeah. fighting. Was that taking you away from? Was that getting all your aggression, frustration? You can do that in a football pitch to a certain degree, but you can't do it. It's different in a boxing ring yeah. because it's not only fighting your fears, it's the nerves, it's everything going into a fight, no matter. Listen, we do sparring up in Glasgow and I still get scared going into spar. No matter yeah. how long you do it, you're fucking scared. But after it, you feel yeah. you feel like a man. You feel yeah, tough. Yeah. You feel like Definitely. there's no pressure. And for that few hours of that day, you feel great. Yeah. Like, because you're fighting. I think it's fighting your fears. I think it all yeah. boils down to is we're all scared as human yeah. beings. Like, you being the angriest man in the room is the weakest man, I believe. So yeah. you're being angry and frustrating and fighting. If everyone shows me, okay, he's a bit vulnerable here. Yeah. Why do you think you went, why did you think every year you get angrier and angrier and angrier? Is that because you've seen your career slipping and the people you played football with under 21 level have kicked on and, yeah. and cemented bingo. themselves as yeah, big players? Bingo. It took me a long time to realise why I was angry. I was angry at myself. I wasn't angry at anybody else. I was angry that how has this become this? How have I gone from there to here? I'm angry at myself. And like I said, you see everybody else who you played with, who you just as good as, if not better, at younger age, and they're doing this and you're doing this and just angry at myself, yeah. And like I said, it wouldn't have mattered. It could have been Alex, Sir Alex Ferguson. It wouldn't have mattered who my manager was and it wouldn't have mattered what I was doing at the time. I was destined to crash and burn, no matter what I'd have been doing, whether it had been football, boxing, fucking banker, whatever it was. Yeah. How do you feel when you were doing all that shit you, was part of you feeling it was normal because you were so used to the chaos in your younger years or did you realise what you were doing was wrong? I knew what I was doing was wrong. Yeah, deep down I knew what I was doing was wrong. Because when you hit 26 to retire at 26, you haven't even hit your prime. They say players no. hit their prime 27, 28, 29, 30. Even now with things changing, the fitness levels, there's players playing in their 30s, late yeah. 30s. Look at Ibrahimovic, look mm -hmm. at, who's the Juventus goalie? Buff Buffon, Buffon, yeah. 42, 43. Yeah, yeah. It's phenomenal Crazy, that things are doing. But for you to make that decision at 26, was that a relief for you to retire? Big time, yeah. Big Why? Time, massive relief because I just need to get out of that pressure keg of football. I just need to get out. So it was a massive weight off my shoulders. The last season I actually played was at Grimsby Town and I played, I think, like 18 games for them with my old youth team manager, Russell Slade who again was someone that when he went out of my life, my life started to spiral out of control. I was scared of Russ. Russ was an old school youth team manager. But now, now in these days, you can't do the things that Russ used to do to us. It'd be classed as bullying or whatever. But Russ was fucking brilliant. You know what I mean? Russ would Russ had, Russ had make you run through brick walls for him because we all respected and feared him as well. Fucking crazy bastard, Russ. Um, but I needed somebody like that to keep me in check. So as soon as Russ left Sheffield United, it was another one that all of a sudden, I haven't got that fear factor. Fucking has loads of things. Like if Russ gets older, yeah. and Russ would get older you as well. You know what I mean? He'd even join in and training and smash you with elbows. And he, he used to come like, like training and say, listen, fucking give him one today in training. <laughs> and all things like that. But he was proper old school, loved him, great bloke. So he was a Grimsby town manager. In fact, I went from I'm missing out Hull City. So I went from Peterborough United to Hull City. Mm -hmm. um, Your hometown. My hometown club. So that was, for me, the last roll of the dice of if I can't find that, whatever it is, back from my hometown club, um, a lot of my mates used to go and watch them week in, week out. Then I know I'm done. It's over. Um, it took me a while to get into the team. First, like, five, six, seven games I was on the bench. Got into the team. 
started playing okay. Um, went out one night, ended up having a, having, having a fight with... I didn't even... I know... Listen, I'm wondering, if I've done something, I'll be the first one, yeah, fucking hell, my fault. But I've gone out. This kid started on me in the bar. I'd had literally one mouth of beer. I stood at the bar. He's pissed. He's been out. It was a Tuesday night, actually. We played... We played Millwall on Sky Sports. We beat them 1-0, and I got man of the match. So I had no plans to go out, and I thought, and I, like I said, I've not been, I've just got in the team, so I thought, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm back in the game. Let's go out and celebrate, have a few beers. So I've gone out in Beverly, and this kid started on me, and we went outside. Uh, no, I went outside to leave, and him and his few of his mates ran outside and started, and this guy fucking started throwing punches at me, so... I hit him with one of the best shots I've ever thrown in my life. It made that, uh, that noise and I knocked him out and he ended up breaking his jaw in six places. So we had the Wednesday off. I turned up to training Thursday. As soon as I pulled in, there's a fucking cop car there. And you just know straight away, don't you, that it was for me. So I've got my gear on, slid out the back, got into the training ground. As I'm doing the warm up, Police have come, arrested me on the on the training ground. I got charged. What did I get? Serious what? assault. It's bad, yeah. And bearing in mind, I've got the, that phrase. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, I'm thinking, I'm doing jail here, 100%. Luckily for me, there was a girl in the in the bar who I know um, that's a... Um, sp special police officers, are they called? She's like a special PSO mm -hmm. or something like that. She's seen it all. So she th she actually said, this was like a month after I'd been arrested and charged. So it, it goes to CPS, doesn't it, or something like that. Well, she actually went in and gave a statement and said, because the guy had said that he was having a burger outside and I'd just gone out and hit him. So I was like, that didn't happen. And, the, and they were like, well, that's what he said. You broke his jaw, you know, he's in a bad way. Da, da, da. I was like, fucking hell, this didn't happen. So the girl that was in there went and gave a statement saying, I was literally stood two meters from it all. Oh, Kurt's at the bar having a drink. The guy's come over, attacked him. Kurt's put his beard on and left. And then him and his mates all ran out to try and, to try and get him. Otherwise, I'd have, I'd have got... Three I'd, years, four years. I'd have yeah. got a good few years, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so I was so lucky that mm -hmm. that lady um, was in there. So would that come under self-defense or...? I, I, got, I didn't get charged with anything. All charges were dropped. Oh, yeah, because it, it, it attacked me for no yeah. reason. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing anything. I'd literally had half a Budweiser. So it wasn't as if I was drunk and disorderly. And um, was that all over the papers as well? Yeah, yeah. So they'd even said, like, oh, you've been boozing all day. I'm like, well, if you put Sky Sports on, I was fucking on there from half seven to um, half nine. And this, this incident happened at like 10 past 10. So say I've had 40 minutes, I've got to get a shower, I've got to get from Hull to Beverly, which is 20 minutes, which leaves me 10 minutes to get pissed. You, you know what I mean? So it is what it is. But luckily, but at this point, bear in mind, I've already gone to Hull City with a Bad reputation anyway. Peter Taylor's my old England under 21s manager. So he's kind of thought, well, let's give him a let's give him a final chance type of thing. And this took ages to come out with what actually happened. By the time it had come out, the club had already thought, we can't be dealing with this. And they ended up paying me up. And uh, Russell Slade, who was at Grimsby Town, rang me and says, uh, will you come and play for us till the end of the season? I said, I'm done, Russ, I'm, I'm retiring. Um, he's like, what do you mean you're retiring? You're fucking 25. He said, come and play till the end of the season. I said, I'll come, but I promise I'm going to retire. I'm going to become a professional fighter. So he was like, fucking hell, what's he, what's he doing now? So I ended up going to play for Grimsby, but I'd already made that decision that I was done. So playing them last 18 games, I played really well for Grimsby. Get them in the playoffs? Yeah, we got beat in the playoff final, yeah. How many people at Wembley? Um, it was at Cardiff. Was Wembley was getting redone at the time, yeah. How many people? I'm not sure. It was Grimsby yeah. versus Cheltenham. Yeah. Not many. I probably had a shower in front of more people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh <-huh. laughs> but it was good to bow out. Me, me, yeah. um, my like eldest it. son was at that game as well. Um, but yeah, we lost. But I played well because I knew it was over. So I could just relax and just think, I'm just playing football for the last 18 games of my life. I'm never going to play again. Um, That's but, sad to see that, Curtis. Like yeah. 25 years old to think that, especially with your son... They're playing at one of the biggest stadiums on the planet, Millennium yeah. Stadium, to thinking this is me retiring and feeling like it's a relief. It's like people who are going to commit suicide. I've worked with a suicide centre in Scotland called Chrissy's House and the people who have tried to commit suicide but not. The day 
it ends up falling through. But the day they, they know they've got to commit suicide, they feel happier than they've ever been. That it's over. That it's over. Mm. And it's you at 25 to think that this is my last game and then you feel even happier. Yeah. It's mad that to think that. I understand that feeling that you just spoke about. It was a mm. massive, it was a massive um, relief. I was so glad it was done. Then I'm not having to torture myself over like, because you know, every everything that went wrong in my career was my fault. So I ain't even got anyone to blame. I can't like blame injury. I had a couple of injuries, but nothing like that affected my career massively. I've had sep seven operations on my left knee, but nothing that like I can say, ah, if my knee hadn't gone, this, this, and this. So I, I had nothing to blame it on apart from my own ill discipline and circumstances, you yeah. know. So that that's difficult to deal with, having to, having to look in the mirror and know that your shortcomings are your own doing. It's mm -hmm. hard. It happens though, but what is did your old, your old boy pass away? So my dad died when he was 52. How old were you? So I'd have been 28. So after you retired, but he still yeah. got to see you fulfill your potential and live your dreams and yeah. do that. So listen, football's not everything. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But I must admit, it must have been frustrating for my dad Yeah. to watch his son coming through as a teenager, talked about as a hot prospect, to then be watching me mm -hmm. at Leighton Orient in front of one man and his dog. <laughs> yeah. So to see that, that drop off. Yeah. And when I retired, I felt guilty as well because my family gave a lot for me to get here and I've pissed it away. My career, I should have been able to retire and make the next three, four generation of Woodhouses financially comfortable. That's the reality of what I should have done. But that's that's not what happened. So that guilt of feeling like you've you've let people down, that was that was hard. Yeah, but hindsight's a wonderful thing. As you mm. say, we can't always concentrate in the past. But what happens is for your son who's turning eighteen, go well, my dad can make play in the Premiership. He can be a, a British champion. Your career's not that bad, brother. Yeah. That that can eventually spur on your son's kids, your grandkids to go. He can do it. So. No matter what you've done in your life, people can still take inspiration from it. Yes, yeah. you were the bad boy of football. You've probably had to live up to that reputation every team you went, and then you've done fuck it. But it takes a lot of balls to retire at 26, yeah. knowing that you haven't even hit your prime yet. So for you to make that transition to then quit football, to then get into boxing, what was people saying? They think he's fucking lost his mind. I was a mind. laughing stock, yeah. <laughs> I was a laughing stock. Um, yeah, it was like, everyone was like taking the piss. But, I've always been very bull-headed. The more people took the piss, the more it kind of lit a fire underneath me. And honestly, I genuinely thought that um, that I was good. I didn't realise I was really bad until the bell went for the, my first ever fight. I was fighting a guy called Dean Mark Antonio, and uh, Dean Powell was my manager. Uh, Dean's not with us anymore. He actually committed suicide. He, I'm sorry to hear yeah, that. Yeah, he, he, and he was a great man boxing through and through. And he was my first ever manager. I was signed with Frank Warren. And he says, we found you your first fight. Um, it's like a week before the fight. So I'm thinking, fucking, I haven't got anyone to fight yet. So he rang me up, got you someone, Kurt. Brilliant. I was like, all oh, right, class, who is it? He's like, it's called Dean Mark Antonio. And I said, fucking no chance. I'm not, I'm not, that ain't happening. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I've never had a fight. You can't chuck me in with a Mexican. He'll fucking kill me. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, he's not a Mexican. He's a fucking window cleaner from London. <laughs> he said, he's the worst kid we can find. He said, he boxed one of our lads last week and our lad shit. And he made him look like Sugar Ray Leonard. He said, if you can't beat this guy, he says, there's fucking nothing we can do with you. And I remember coming back after the first round of fighting, the worst guy they can find thinking, I think I've lost that round. <laughs> so it was a realization of it's absolutely fine chinning someone in a nightclub when you're ailed up. But there's a big difference between that and boxing when you've got a sky camera in front of you and you're doing something against someone who's been doing it since they were 10 years of age. And I've only ever had a fight when I'm drunk. Then all of a sudden I have to do it sober. The nerves, the pressure of it all. And I realise I'm really bad at this. And I end up winning my, I beat Dean Mark Antonio by, I think it was one point and I knocked him down twice. So I just scraped through. Hmm. Um, and it was a real humbling, humbling experience. And that's what boxing did for me more than anything. It humbled me really, really quickly, really quickly. And that's the beauty of the sport. And I love it. And it, it's such a tough sport. 
You know, there's no money in it. People see like Anthony Joshua and and uh, and Tyson Fury, and they're going to split like 150 million. They think we all get that fighting for peanuts. How much did you get for that fight? So I got paid two and a half grand for that fight. How much were you getting at Grimsby a week? About the same. So you're getting that weekly, but you got that for a 10 week training camp, paying trainers, playing managers, yeah. probably walked away with yeah. fuck all. Yeah, I but did you feel happier? Yeah, I felt like I'd achieved something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even though I beat Dean Mark Antonio and he was rubbish, I was rubbish as well. And that was on the telly? That was on, the, it was on ITV, yeah. Kevin Mitchell in that fight that night? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Shout out to Kevin. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you'd lost that fight, do you think you'd have kicked on? Or do you think you'd have quit? I fucking don't know how to box after that. <laughs> well, he's ranked one eight nine one ninety. <laughs> yeah, where do we go from here? Yeah, but um, is that what he was ranked one eight nine and you were ranked one ninety? Yeah. So when the when the rank the the British Boxing Border Control rankings came out the week before, so there was a hundred no, there's hundred eighty seven fighters in my weight mm. category, and I was ranked one hundred eighty seventh, and he was ranked one hundred eighty sixth. So it's like the Donkey Derby, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know what pissed me off? Like when I beat him, they kept me where I am and kept him where he was because he thought, oh, I'm not sure even if he won that. <laughs> <laughs> so I beat him and still uh -huh. didn't move up a place. So it was madness. What was the press treat you like? Yeah, the awful. Bad? They all took the piss, yeah. I remember reading the headline the day after saying, I wonder where the circus stops next. Because that was the first one. Obviously, you've had, since then, you've had Freddie Flint off come out and, and box, Rio Ferdinand. He said he that. was gonna, yeah, his ass um, went. but his ass fell out. <laughs> <laughs> Probably got hit on the nose and thought, mm, not sure yeah. about this. Um, obviously, Leon McKenzie boxed and, and did well in a short space of time. But Leon's from a family of boxers, you know. Um, so I was kind of the first one to come out. So the press were like pretty brutal towards me. But even in the build up to it, I was, I was like, yeah, it's all right, you wait till they see me box. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, fucking hell, this kid's brilliant. And then, like I said, one round in, I'm all over the place. So they must be like, oh, this kid's shit. So they were all taking the piss out of me. Um, so that was difficult as well, because no matter what happened in my football career, people had always genuinely accept that I'm a good player. So there's always only, the only negative press I'd get was when I'd get in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, normally the match reports, yeah. I'd normally play all right. How was that for you, going through racism as a young kid? all the torment of other people to then try to do something with your life in the press writing negative comments. How does that affect you mentally? It was difficult because I, f I felt like they weren't giving me a fair crack of the whip. Give me, at least give me a chance. You know what I mean? Don't, you know, they, uh, these, uh, these kids have been doing it since they were 10 years of age. I've not put a pair of gloves on until I was 26. I thought they'd have been a little bit more sympathetic, but it kind of felt like everyone wanted to stick the knife in as soon as they possibly could. But with your character, is that not a case of, okay, fuck you, I'm going to show you? Yeah, And exactly you end up that. kicking on. So you end up winning your first 10 fights, is that correct? First nine. Yeah. How are you feeling after that? Are you oh, feeling King I'm going Kong. to be world champion? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm big in... Um... But that's, that's some feat in itself yeah. for putting the gloves on at 26 and then no matter who you're fighting, anybody can win a fight, I believe yeah. anyway. But to win your first nine fights, were you then thinking, okay, I've got something here? Well, if you go into Iceland now and mention my name, I'm big over there. Because mm -hmm. anyone that's around about 10 stone seven that's from Iceland, I dusted them off. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, got, <laughs> we got all the shit fighters, and <laughs> all of them from everywhere. Yeah. And, 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 um, but yeah, I was getting better. You know, I was getting better. I wasn't matched hard. You know, there's no, I, you know. But I was learning on the job. And then I fought a guy called Jay Morris who actually had the audacity to start punching me back. And I was like, well, what's going on here? <laughs> this is how it works. Um, Jay was tough, like a rugged journeyman. Had been around the game for a long time, been in with some good fighters. And he just outmanned me. Simple as that. He was just too tough for me at that time. It's amazing what happens to your body once you've been a pro for about five, six, seven years. It becomes like that. It's fucking hard. Rock solid. Your body's hard. You're conditioned. I'd been a footballer for 10 years, so my body was like jelly. <laughs> you know mm. what I mean? It just wasn't that teak. You know, fighters have got a... Yeah, solid. The different, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and he was teak tough. And I was still had the little footballer's body, really. And he just shoved me about. He beat me by one point. It was a close fight. Um, I was devastated. It was on, it was on Satanta as well. Live on Satanta. Um, that one hurt, yeah. It's like everything. The first one's always the hardest to mm -hmm. take, isn't it? And I did the usual, I retired and that was it, I'm done. Fucking judges, fix, blah, blah, blah. But then after I kind of got my head out of my ass, I thought. It was actually Adam Booth that saved my career at that point. He rang me up the next day and 
He's like, how do you feel? I'm like, I'm gutted. He said, I'm done. I'm, I'm retiring. If I can't beat Jay Morris, you know, well, I'm never going to be British champion, am I? Because I'd come out and said I'd win the British title within two years, me being a fucking idiot. Um, so I'm like, Jay Morris at that time had like won six, lost 20 odd. Um, if I can't beat Jay Morris, like, what am I going to do? And I'll never forget, Adam said to me, he said, have you heard of a fighter called Muhammad Ali? I'm like, yeah, obviously. He said, you know, he's lost five fights, don't you? I'm like, yeah. He says, so Muhammad Ali can lose five, but Curtis Woodhouse can't lose one. He said, like, get your head out of your ass. You know, get back in the gym. There's loads you need to work on. Fucking get on with it type of thing. And I put the phone down. I was like, yeah, he's right. You know what I mean? What Am I, am I going to be the guy that then runs away from football, that then runs away from boxing, that then runs away from this? I didn't want to be that guy. So I had to dig down, dig down deep and swallow a bit of pride and fucking get on with it. Yeah. And I did. Do you think you can run away too easily? Throw the, throw the toys out the pram a bit? No, I don't think I can. Like I said, it, that, that's just the perception people have had. Mm -hmm. I've never run away from anything in my life, but oh, he's, he's left football, now he's leaving boxing. I knew that that would be the perception of what of what people would have of me. I didn't want to be that guy. So I didn't did... want to be that guy that walked down the street and people were like, that's Curtis Woodhouse, and he lost his first fight and fucking did a runner. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. When did you get the British title chance? How many fights in? Eight years in. So that's a long journey as well. Thirty-five yeah. fights in. Is that yeah. how many you've had? Thirty-five, lost seven. I, I came back, didn't I? I had three yeah. more, so I think I've had thirty-eight. Yeah. That's fucking a lot of fights in only yeah. a short period of time. Many fights we have in a year, three, four. As many as I can, really, <laughs> because at the time I, I've got no income. Yeah. I've got no source of income. Did you have any savings or anything? Did you spunk it all? I had some, yeah, but mm -hmm. not what I should have done. Yeah. You know, it doesn't last forever, does it? Mm -hmm. I've got a wife and three children to to provide for, big house, fast car, all the football stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm I'm fucking fighting tooth and nail for fifteen hundred quid per <laughs> fight or whatever. So <laughs> it doesn't go far. Uh -huh. See, when you started getting fitter though, twenty eight, twenty nine, when you were doing the boxing, did you ever feel like? jumping back into football? I, I played a bit of part-time football to provide a wage. Mm -hmm. I could still play at these Dagnum level. Redgrave. And I played for Rushton and Diamonds. Rushton and Diamonds. They were chucking like crazy money about at one point. So I jumped on that gravy train and yeah. that was uh, that was fun. But yeah, I, I, I was done. I just it just seen it as just a source of income. Mm -hmm. What about when you won the British title? How was that feeling for you to prove everybody wrong that it could be done for the yeah. first guy you ever go from football? To boxing to then winning a British title, which is a it'll phenomenal never be done achievement. Again. That, that's the thing. It'll never, ever be done again. Never. Impossible. It's it's as close to impossible. So you 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 go and watch England under 21s. You watch the next next game that they play and think one of them is going to become a British boxing champion. It would just never happen. Um, I was immensely proud. And not even because of the destination, like we spoke about. It's the journey. I lost six fights on my way to go there. Six opportunities to retire, to quit. I got knocked out twice. I, I got ridiculed the whole way through, apart from maybe the last 18 months before I won the British title. I think people started to think, I mean, I boxed Steffi Bull, who'd had like 40 odd fights at the time, being him some good kids. I stopped him in nine rounds. I then went and boxed Frankie Gavin, who's like uh, the UK's greatest ever amateur. I lost on a split decision. That was when people thought, Okay, now I was a hundred to one to to win that fight in a two horse race. The disrespect is unbelievable. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I was hundred to one, and I lost on a split decision. But even after that, it was all ah uh, uh, Frankie Gavin didn't perform, didn't train properly, blah blah blah. It was never like okay, now it's actually boxed well that night. And then I went on and I beat Dave Ryan, tough tough man, um, for the English title. So at this point, that's the beauty of boxing. When the bell rings, the truth is always told. There's no bullshit. You can't, you win or you lose and people see how you fight. So it's not, I'm beating and competing with good kids. So whether they want to give me the respect or not, they have to because I'm getting in with good quality fighters. So I was starting to get, okay, now this kid's not bad. And then obviously the, the opportunity to fight Darren Hamilton was a massive one for me. And it, it was literally a stone's throw away from where my dad died. So that was huge. Lo losing, I feel real bad saying this, but losing my dad was the reason I won the British title because it was a re it gave me a reason to carry on doing it because it was the last thing I ever said to my dad. I promised him that I'd do it. 
So having that burden to carry um, was hard. Because like I said, my dad's my hero, always will be. Like I said, the scariest man I've ever, ever met. And, and some things I, I could tell you that it, it'd be, you wouldn't believe it, but they're all true. Um, but he's also, like we all are, a product of his own environment. You know, to be left on Bernardo's doorsteps at six weeks of, of age, not know who his family are, to be in a complete white area, to get um, racially abused most of his life until he kind of starts fighting back. So my dad had, had his issues as well. So, and he, he came through them all and became a, a, a respectable kind of, uh, of guy. So my dad's my hero. So to I didn't want the last thing I ever said to my dad to not come true. So to actually win the British title was, again, felt like the day I retired from professional football. <sighs> Thank God for that. Because, you know, speaking about nightmares, not being able to sleep, I've then got that fucking hell. I, my, my hero, and I've like, the last thing I said is a lie, it's bullshit. Every time I lost that that feeling, it drags you down and it's really debilitating. So to, to get that moment where I'm the new, it was, thank God for that. I'd hate to think what my life would be now without winning the British title. It wouldn't be good. Yeah. Do you think you would still be here? I don't know. I've had dark moments. You know, I've been through some really, really tough parts of my life that I've never really spoke about to anybody. As soon as this is my last ever podcast that I'm ever going to do. Um, yeah, it's been tough at times. And yeah, I'd hate to think More, where yeah. I'd have been. Just, just struggling to deal with your past and having to accept what you've done. Loads of bad things that I've done um, that I'm not proud about, never spoke about. And, and they're hard. To, to deal with at times. And like I said, on top of that, if I hadn't have kept that that promise, that would have been tough. Yeah, I know you've got kids, I know you've got your missus and that, but was it the boxing that kind of changed your life? <clears throat> and it's a bit of a cliche to say boxing saved my life because it didn't. Yeah, I saved my life. Of course, man. You know what I mean? I take credit for it myself mm -hmm. and it could have been anything. If I'd have bumped into Steve Redgrave, I might have ended up being a rower. But I was fortunate that I met Gary DeRue, you know, and being... I'm a big believer in you are the company you keep. And all of a sudden, once I started to step away from football, I'm no longer in a drinking environment. People don't booze in boxing. Fucking game's too hard and serious. You're not mm -hmm. out three, four days a week on the piss. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I'm around different people. I'm around inspiring people. that I'm looking at like, fucking this guy, superhero. I want to be like him. So I changed my life. Nobody else. Yeah. No, nothing else. No other sport. I had the the gumption to do it myself. That's the thing I'm really, really proud about. Like I said, how many loads of people fall by the wayside and never come back? And I, I came back. Yeah, you see the guys in the pubs and it's could have, I could have been a contender, I could have made something, but you have played at the elite level. Yeah. And all departments and every sport you've jumped in, you've got that mindset, but it's that other mindset with the, the self-doubt and the, the thinking you're not good enough. But that comes, people need to understand actually what you've came through, the, mm. race, the racial abuse, the... The hostile environment in a household where you're probably, you says Ellie, you can't sleep at night, and that affects you. The trauma affects mm. you for, for eternity. It's to try and break the connection. So when you think about that pain, the emotion isn't there as much. But that comes with, I don't know, therapy. I've never done therapy myself, but maybe going to try it myself. Also, yeah. it's something that I'd really like to work on and go to deeper levels and work on in a child as well. But for everything you went through, you've still had a great career. You've, yeah, you proved all the doubt was wrong. But I believe that's when you perform better is when you're underdog when everybody doubts you because that's yeah. when you start making something of your life you start taking the foot off the gas yeah. because you've fucking accomplished that yeah, I always yeah. use Tyson Fury as prime example that he won all the belts most famous man on the planet undefeated hot the biggest depression in his life yeah. because when he set that goal and achieved that it's done they're not, it's done what yeah. is it that's not, that, wait a minute I've still not feel fulfilled here yeah. I don't feel complete because when you get these things it is external stuff it's like I've said to you during this interview the journey is so much better than the yeah, destination. Yeah, of course. It's to enjoy it though. Yeah. And that's the fucking difficult part because yeah. we concentrate on a finishing line. When we get the finishing line, we create another one. Yeah. And then for you know what, time flash, flashes that fast yeah. and then we're 50, we're 60, but you've still got memories to live. Your kids have seen you playing at football stadiums. Yeah. Your mum's seen you win British titles. So it's still a great thing. Like I do these podcasts. I know my mum enjoys them. My friends at her work say, oh, I'm watching James's podcast and, yeah. and she feels that good. It's just that 
wee bit of goodness to try and help others around you to feel good because you're achieving something, which is a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that I've I've done so much better in later life is being being able to communicate, being able to talk about different things, and um, and that's a massive, massive help. It, it like you said, it is kind of a therapy, but I think it takes a long time to deal with as, as men to deal with things and 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 be able to get them out because you you feel like God, I hope people don't think I'm a pussy. Yeah. Like that's the kind of environment and background that I'm from. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I'm, it took me a long, long time to feel um, what's the right word I'm looking for comfortable within my own skin. That's why I can talk about anything. I can talk about anything now, and it, I don't feel nervous. I don't feel embarrassed. I don't feel bad about talking about my past. If I'm in a the most violent situation happens out in the street, my heart rate don't go up by like one beat, and that's a terrible thing. I yeah. think that's really bad. Mm-hmm. Have you ever done counselling or therapy? No. Have you ever spoke to anyone? I'm similar to you though. It's on. It's on. It's on the list. Yeah, I think I've, I've got a lot of things I still need to get I've, better. I've at. been trying to do it for two years. I went once about three years ago, and I done fuck that. I'm not going back. Yeah, it's fucking scary. Now we can sit here and talk about the pain of the past, but there's stuff that we will not speak about yeah. in front of camera because there's still something there. We need to speak to somebody who we yeah. can trust. And I think the day we truly do that is the day we'll truly heal. Yeah. I believe. I've we- got a couple of things that I've never, ever spoke about. Yeah. And I'm not sure I ever would. When I wrote my book. Yeah, Box to Box. Yeah. When I wrote that, I, I was, I just thought I'm just not ready to quite go there yet. Yeah. You know. But there will be a time when you'll feel ready. Maybe. When I believe, like, there's stuff that I won't speak about, there's stuff that I'll take to the grave also, mm. but... Like I always say I'm open and this and that, but there's still some of me holds back because yeah. we're worried how other people perce- perceive. Perception. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's- do you know what? And I actually spoke to my mate on the way down here. Shout out to Wardy. Big, Shout out to Wardy. Big, uh, big yeah. fan of yours. Uh-huh. I could tell you some stories about him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know. This would never be able to go live. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what was I saying then? Yes, I, I, I spoke to Wardy on the way down here about... Um, it's going to be my last ever podcast, so mm-hmm. speak about most things. But I've got a life outside of this as well. There's some things I don't want my kids to know, future kids that I'm working with uh, as well. Even though it might be good for them to hear me talk about certain situations and certain things that I've done which are terrible. But I don't know. Like you said, perception of how people are going to look in. I work with a lot of schools, a lot of naughty kids that are from bad background, not difficult backgrounds. It all starts in, in the home. You know, all the, all the problems kids have come from the home because you are the company you keep. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure I'll ever be quite ready to put it out there because like I said, people look in and judge. Mm-hmm. And if I told you certain things, people would say, he's a f- fucking disgusting human being. So I'm not quite ready to go there yet. Yeah, but you've been judged your whole life, so you know yeah. what it feels like, and the, the pressures of success. It's not just about having a talent and being successful. It's can you deal with the pressures, the outside noise, people's opinion, especially with social media kicking off. Yeah. I think you probably came out and retired when social media was just kicking off. So yeah. can you imagine at that time, everything in the papers, you know what they say, the papers have wrote much shit about me, yeah. and it's fucking been bullshit. Yeah. But you just accept it. So everybody's got an opinion. Somebody will throw back in your face what you've done. And it's an well, opinion. That, that opinion then becomes fact. Yeah. You see it that many times, you read it that many times, mm-hmm. people assume that that is actually true. Mm-hmm. And hey, social media is the devil, isn't it? You actually met a troll on live TV. Yeah. And what happened? I nearly killed him. I was going to batter him. So I put out a post. It was actually the day after I lost my English title. So I put out a post saying, just doing the school run, um, have a great day, everyone. And he put a post back out saying... Um, you want to be careful where you drop your kids at school. You never know who's watching. That's what he put. So I'm like, there's a certain line, isn't they? I don't mind being called shit box or shit football online. I don't mind all that's water for ducks back. But once people start putting what I class as a threat to my family, I thought, I'm not having this. So I put on Twitter, I put a bounty on his head. I said, I'll give anyone a thousand pounds who tells me who this guy is. I had his name, address and everything within five minutes. Somebody that messaged me, um, <laughs> someone who messaged me, um, how can I put this? I had the deeds to his house. So he sent me like where he lived, everything. Um, so I put it up on my social media and I sat and had his address and I was 47 minutes away. So I said to him, I'll see you in 47 minutes. 
And I was just on my way there. And Joey Barton retweeted it. He's got like six and a half million followers. And John Prescott, you know, the um, the politician from mm-hmm. Hull, he's a guy who, someone egged him, didn't they? And he, he hit him with a one-two. <laughs> he, he tweeted saying, this is how we deal with shit in Hull. <laughs> <laughs> so it was crazy. Yeah. Then like Lorraine Kelly got hold of it. Mm-hmm. Lorraine Kelly, I went on, a uh, good morning show the week after. I got mm. fucking paid more for going on that than I did for my English title uh-huh. fight. <laughs> so it, it was bonkers. But I just went and tracked him down. And um, and yeah, he gave a groveling apology. But people can't just say whatever they want to say, can yeah. they? That's not how life it's works. Abuse. And you know what? When, you know, when I've been out in town or, or I'm in a bar mm-hmm. or whatever, no one ever says anything to you, yeah. do they? Everyone just comes up and says, oh, hi, mate. Mm-hmm. I've seen your British title fight. I was there that yeah. night. Everybody's nice, yeah. It's madness, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. then you go on social media, like, where yeah. are all these yeah. guys? Because I was doing a thing up in Glasgow. I was doing like a reality show kind of thing. And when it just started, there, somebody was giving me proper shit. And I thought, nasty bastard. Because that was the first I'd ever tasted any of that stuff. Yeah. And I thought, nasty. Like, and I was saying, t- talking about some nasty shit about my, my kids and stuff. And I says, I'm going to fucking batter you. Like, I was wanting his number, this and that. Forgot all about it, but I actually seen him. We were up and uh, there's a place called the Fort in Glasgow, and I'd never forgot it because I I, I couldn't sleep in that. I'm thinking, what if this is real? Yeah, it was my first proper threat. Seen him. Say what you saying now, that kid. Oh, sorry, big man. Just fucking slapped him. Yeah, just slapped him. Put him in his place. But you need to learn not to do that shit also because you know all these people are cowards and it is as you get older and the more you learn but you shouldn't have to accept that sort of pish that talk shit get banged I believe do you know what I mean so but fair play to that kid for coming on the telly with you well it depends on what you got paid doesn't it did they get dough for it as well so he's making money off giving people you know what though I didn't even know he was going to be on the show so I was going on Lorraine Kelly to talk about Mm -hmm. um, trolls and all things like that so I've gone up to London the day before as most of the, my stories start off, we were in London. I'm a northerner. We don't get to London much. So I decided to have a few beers. So I've, we, I, we're on the breakfast show. It's like six in the morning they get you in. So they picked us up. I'm getting makeup done. Lorraine's coming. She's a pretty little thing, actually. <laughs> so she is. And she smelled lovely. Um, so Lorraine came in and says, oh, Curtis, I just want to let you know that we've got James on the show as well. Mm-hmm. So apparently my arm hung over. I'm, I'm like, what? She said, oh, yeah, he's on the show. So I'm like, Right. And she says, and I'll never forget, she says, I've just got to let you know that this isn't Jeremy Kyle, that we haven't got any security. So I'm like, if he starts talking, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay him out clean live on breakfast television. So she's gone, you, are you gonna hit him? I'm like, depends on how he how, and how he deals with it all. So she's like panicking. So she turned around, I've seen her run back into his room, and she's come back in two minutes later. She's going, No, he he just wants to say he's really, really sorry. So he don't want any like violence or confrontation at all. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, we'll kind of see how it goes. Did then. you speak? I didn't know what show? he looked like at yeah. this point. Uh-huh. So I'm thinking, fucking hell, he's not a big lump. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And he walked out and he, I, I felt bad actually because he's like a young, youngish kid and he was shitting himself. He was a bag of nerves. Yeah. Um, and he came out and just said, sorry, blah, blah, blah. But just going back to what he said, do you not think when these people are abusing you and it's easy to kind of fire back at them, but... Do you not think that these probably have got a lot going on as well? Yeah, no, it's a reflection of them. They're not in a good place, Yeah, no, that's, that's them projecting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of them are mentally disturbed. Like, I yeah. get crazy messages. We get fucking 10,000 messages on all platforms each week. So it's yeah. a lot of messages and you look at messages and you go, ah, you're not right in the fucking yeah. head. And, and I bet 99% of the stuff you get is positive. It's all love. But it's that one But I concentrate one. on the 1% and I think you mug. It sticks with you. Yeah, it? and then you think two weeks later and then they pop into your head again yeah. and you want to see them. But it can steal your your energy straight away, it can ruin your yeah. whole day and obviously I'm getting, you, are get, you do get used to it, yeah, you, do you do get used to it. and it, Get numb to it all Yeah, that, yeah. and you kind of, but, but it makes you kind of recluse as well, it makes you kind of, it's a lonely journey trying to be successful as well, like I only interview people. Do you know why? Why is that? Because not many people are successful. Yeah. There's not many people that mm-hmm. are. So people that are, people look in and whether you're the same as them, but you're doing good stuff and they don't fucking like it. And that and that's why it's 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 lonely on the top of a mountain, isn't it? Yeah, that's the horrible thing. Like I I will support anybody, and I yeah. genuinely mean that. Like, but if you fuck me over, I'm done. But when you become successful, you start seeing people turn against you. The people who yeah. can't get to your heights become envious. Yeah. When you were doing your boxing stuff, was it a lonely journey, or did you? Well, no, cause most of it, I was shit. 
<laughs> I wouldn't keep saying that though because yeah. you won the fucking British title. Yeah, I got there in the end. Yeah. Um, and what happened after the British title? Did you lose it to was it Willie Lemon? Willie Lemon, yeah. I but, know Willie is a good yeah, friend great. as well. I spoke to him a couple of yeah, weeks ago. Good guy, Kept man. In touch fucking him, yeah. bonkers. He put Can in his ass. He should have beat. Yeah. Can I think Can got an eleven count or twelve yeah, count did, as yeah. well? And then um, he's down a while, wasn't he? He sparred him with Ricky Burns as well. Another fucking good Scotsman. Hell. What a long week that was. Yeah. Yeah. So. um yeah, they rang me up. He was fighting Michael Katsidis, was Ricky Burns. Like, come forward, strong fighter. So they rang me up and said, um, uh, it was Billy Nelson rang me up and said, would you come and spar with Ricky Burns? Ricky Burns like a super featherweight at the time. I'm a welter. So I'm like a stone and a half, two stone heavier. Than him. And Billy said, we'll pay you a grand a week. I'm like, I'll fucking stay there a month if you mm -hmm. want, Bill. So he said, yeah, come up and, and spar with him. Um, so he said, we want you to do eight rounds Monday, eight rounds Tuesday, Wednesday off, eight rounds Thursday, eight rounds Friday. So I'm thinking, Ricky Burns, like super featherweight, not really a puncher, fucking easiest thousand pound I've ever earned in my life. So they picked me up from, um, I think it was Glasgow they picked me up from, train station. Ricky's like the nicest guy ever, you know what I mean? He picked me up in, in this like fucking Nova 1.2, this massive, he's like a boy racer. So I'm chatting away, fucking brilliant, da 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 da. I'm thinking, wow, easy money this. Um, so we've got in, Bellwin. He's a vicious bastard, is Ricky Burns. When the bell went, he was like trying to take me off. I'm like, where's that Ricky from a couple of minutes ago? Mm. But you know what? What that taught me is that elite mentality. And bearing in mind, I'm fighting six and eight rounders at the time. So by when we sparred, he'd get out, he'd do a circuit, and he'd go for a run. And I'm thinking to myself, like, he's miles better than me, which I can accept. I knew that before I got up here. There's no excuse for him outworking me, you know, doing like the circuits and the running after. And after sparring, I can't I hardly move. <laughs> So when I went away from that, that made me think, I've got to work harder. Yeah. Look at this guy. He's getting the maximum out of himself. Because you look at Ricky Burns, you're not looking at like a Floyd Mayweather. Ricky's got the maximum out of the ability he's got. Yeah. And I love that in him. Mm -hmm. You know, I respect that so much in him. And he's a real nice guy, but yeah. Three weight world title. Yeah, he beat the shit out of me. Yeah. I was meant to be up there for two weeks, but he cut me under both eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so me saying I'd last a month, <laughs> joking at you. Happy to go after oh, the week. First day, I'm like, uh, mate, I'm laying uh -huh. put my head on the pillar. Mm -hmm. And my head was like that. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Willie Limond, I lost, I lost my title to Willie Limond. Yeah. How was that feeling? I was done once I won the British title. So you completed that, you took the yeah. foot off the gas took, again. I, I, no disrespect to Willie because, you know, he, he was a good fighter. And you know what I found in boxing? Because I didn't start till 26. What you can't give people is experience, can you? So the ones that had been doing it a long time, I was always a little step behind them. They just knew too much, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I'm sure you doing these now, you know miles more than what you knew when you first yeah, did them. Yeah. So I'm getting in there with Willie Limond, and he knows every trick in the book. He's been in with... Morales, Khan, he's boxed for, since he was like 10 years of age. So he was just always that little fraction mm -hmm. ahead of me. You know what I mean? And uh, I like Willie. I know, you know, you don't want to lose your British title ever, but I didn't, I didn't mind losing it. Yeah, he's a good guy. Very funny idea. bastard. Yeah. yeah, on Twitter, like, you're, you're no holes barred. You, you, you don't hold back on people, but you've got the the love-hate relationship with the Celtic fans. Why is that? Why is it you constantly got the spoon out? Well, because I support Rangers. <laughs> and, and, and they don't like it. Because I always see, oh, here it goes again. You're just... <laughs> With Rangers one so and then it's just you've got to spoon out you're mixing it and the, the, everybody bites like uh, Glasgow no matter Celtic Rangers if you're against one they fucking bite and it's not just one you'll get yeah. them all attacking well you know what I remember when I went up and, and we signed with Rangers they actually sat me down and said um, they spoke to me about obviously the religion this that and the other said there's certain things you cannot mm -hmm. do up here you cannot say said if anyone asks you what religion you are they said just, just say I'm the same as you <laughs> just just say where, mm -hmm. whatever they are what can you I said don't get, go down down that route and at that point I didn't really understand the the Protestant and the Catholic and and the hatred that the the got for each it's other still yeah. bad I got loads of fans at Celtic yeah. fans so I have, I have a good laugh with them and like I said I support Rangers because when I went up there. It blew my mind. And the people tripped me like I was like the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the whole city, I just like fell in love with the place instantly. And um, I'd love to go back there in some capacity, in, in a football capacity. That The whole city, the whole football, it just blew my mind. It was, it was something else. It's like, I don't know, when you first see something like that, it was wow. And yeah, and ever since then, I, I, I followed them. Not religiously, but 
yeah, they're my team. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the uh, Celtic fans don't like me for it. <laughs> it's what it is, isn't it? You can't please yeah. everyone. You've obviously tried manager, managers. You've been a manager as well. Is it Gainsbury's your last yeah, Gainsborough was my shot. last club. Um, because I interviewed Rico Franco yesterday, spoke highly of you. Yeah. He's from that neck of the woods. He I is. Like, I'm fucking, uh, got Curtis on the podcast the next day. Uh, Rico's a undefeated bare knuckle fighter. Great story, great guy. Yeah. And he was speaking about you being the manager there. I said, I'm fucking interviewing him tomorrow. Well, I said I said to our chairman, we should fight me and Rico. Get it on at Gainsborough. You know, we should fight against each other. And then when I went to go and see the chairman one day, Rico was in there because the chairman was sponsoring him. When I stood next to him, I was like, nah, fuck that. He's massive. He's big lump, mm-hmm. isn't he? Yeah, he's a big Yeah, boy. I didn't fancy that yeah, one. Tough guy. Machine. Yeah. What's, what's the hardest thing to do? Manager, football, boxing? Boxing. Is that tough? Yeah. What's it like before a fight, after a fight, compared to football before and after? Boxing mentally is difficult because you, you're bearing your soul to people to watch. You're fighting. That's a personal thing, fighting. Because I'm an alpha male. So when I lose a fight, I feel like I've been stripped of a bit of my manhood. So the pressure leading into that, having to make the weight, everything that goes with it, emotionally it's draining. So after a fight, you'd think you won out, celebrate. I never used to go out after fights ever. I used to fight Saturday night. I used to get a shower and be emotionally, even if I won in one round, two rounds, three rounds, I wasn't physically tired, just emotionally drained and relieved. I think as well, because I knew I, ne- I knew I was never that good. And I won the British title, but I got there by bloody mindedness. I never outboxed anyone in my life. <laughs> I, I never have. Honestly, I haven't. My fights I won by just being tough and getting through it. And I had a few skills, obviously, to get to the level I got to. But every fight was difficult because I didn't have that skill set of a Willie Limond, you know, a Ricky Burns, or, or the good ones that have been doing it for a long time. Mm-hmm. So bo- boxing will always be, no matter what I do, my biggest achievement. Obviously, there's some of the great things that have happened with the football. and But, like I say, because boxing is so hard and that's what makes it so great, isn't it? Yeah. Going forward for the future, Curtis, what's your plans, brother? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing Her Majesty the Queen going down to that's see... That's right, you got yeah. it. Was it B-E-M? Yeah, B-E-M, uh-huh. yeah. Congratulations. British, thank you. So, British Embassy Medal. So you got that at Christmas? I got that at Christmas, yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a blag as well. Uh-huh. When I, I, got, <laughs> I got an email from Her Majesty the Queen. I'm thinking... Fucking hell, I'm going jail here. What's happened? <laughs> and then when I read it, I got a number to ring. So I rang up and the lady answered the phone and was like, um, I was like, oh, I've got an email. She said, oh, what's your name? I said, Curtis Woodhouse. And she went like quiet on the phone for about 15 seconds. So I'm, I'm thinking, she's going down, she must be going down the list or something. She's like, how are you spelling Woodhouse? I'm like, W, w. I said, oh yeah, you're here. Congratulations. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God. So that was amazing. That's an amazing feeling that, that to, to be, recognised for your hard work, really. Football like said, and boxing. Yeah, my football careers, people had miles better careers, the same with boxing, but I think the crossover is is something that will be never never done again. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to going down yeah. and, um, and and meeting the Royals, I suppose. So you should hold your head high for the transition that you've done to still kicking on in life, even yeah. your dark days where you felt, I can't go on anymore. Mm. You've still pushed on. So people can take inspiration from that. Take away all the bullshit from Twitter and social media, from what you've actually achieved and actually what you've went through. So I take my hat off to you, brother, because Thank it's you. not easy. Yeah. I speak to people who battle. Some people don't go through, through it. Yeah. People are t- it's too... It's not going to say easy, but people are taking their life too frequently for my liking yeah. and it's only getting worse. So... It takes a, a big bit of courage to push through those those dark times. Now, no matter if you win the British title, no matter if you go and fucking Barney's Liverpool, you'll still battle yeah. because we're human beings. It's normal. It's it as an emotions, but it's not normal to live there every day. Yeah, to have those battles and have that mindset of I don't live there anymore. I still battle, but the pain is not there. Waking up every day and think I wake up because I've got a bit of a purpose and I've got a bit yeah. of a passion now, which is key as well and I'm exercising more frequently and that helps but I still have my moments and I think fuck all this shit I'm kidding yeah. myself on here and I still have that self doubt yeah. do you know what I mean it's difficult but I know you now you're working with kids to now try and help them yeah the, the realisation for me is how much I've got to give back mm-hmm. and, that, and, that, and because you've loved that yeah and giving back's a brilliant mm-hmm. thing you know I set up the It Starts Monday um, thing that we do now and it's basically a for men that are, you know, looking to get in shape, what we say is we're looking for a healthy mind, body, and soul. 
because everything's linked. You know, when you're training, you're feeling good, you're eating right, you feel better, don't you? Yeah. You know, and we've got loads of people on there that have struggled in the past, and we're just giving them a bit of a community where we can talk and and have accountability as well. You know, so you've got to check in. You you you've got to, you've got to eat good. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And it's beautiful. And it's stretched all around the country. We've got. We've got 200 members up in Scotland. It's brilliant. We've got somebody over in Barbados. We've got a few in Ireland. It's crazy. And all it is, is a group of like-minded men that have maybe lost their way a little bit and need that community feel. And mm. it, it, it's amazing. It's probably the best thing I've ever been involved in because it's so positive. Every day you go on and you see and read other people's stories. And like you said, we're, there's too many men taking their lives isn't there, at such an early age. Yeah. There's got to be a reason for it. Um, and hopefully, if we can, if we can help in that, and kids as well, you know, there's the, the we're doing a charity walk. You'll have to jump on with us. Oh man, we're doing yeah, a 10k yeah. walk up in Where Edinburgh on June the 12th. Send me all the details. We'll post yeah, it on social media. That'll be as well. amazing. I'll be there. And we're we're doing it for um, Sam H Charity, which is a okay. mental health charity uh -huh. up in Scotland um, that work closely with children as well. Um, because again, you know. We understand the tools to deal with it because we're adults. Kids, ima imagine dealing with it as a kid and you don't, you don't really know what's going on. You don't know how to deal with these emotions. You know, and Sam H do loads of amazing work up in, up in Scotland. So yeah, we're doing the, we're finishing it. Is it the military mile that it's called? Yeah, Which leads into Edinburgh Castle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we're doing a 10K mm -hmm. walk and then we're finishing Yeah, let us know, man. I'll there. be there, brother. Yeah, it'd be great. Your book, Box to Box, how was it right now? Was that 2016? Yeah, so that, that, that was difficult. A lot uh, of emotion in that. Yeah, a lot of emotion in that. And that was probably the first time I'd ever spoke about my childhood. Um, so that was tough, but it was good to get it out. I've actually never read it, which is quite... You tend to see that. A lot of people yeah. who write books don't read their books. Like, I don't... Only time I watch these podcasts is to try and get a trailer, but I fucking don't like watching them. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've seen the book in email form. Yeah. So I had to kind of sign off on it, on it first. Um, but I've never read the book. My kids have got it. I don't think my kids have read it either. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, my, they're my only three sales, yeah. I think. <laughs> but I've, I've had like, loads of people have, have contacted me and said, we've read your book. It's like, it was amazing. It's very honest. And because I'm in a position, what I'm in regarding myself is I can be honest because it doesn't affect me either way. I can be out there and speak about what I've been through and speak about my past because I'm comfortable within my own skin. Mm -hmm. And like I say, it's, it's taken me a long time to get there, but yeah, I'm here. Yeah, fair play to you though. Who's the best player you've ever played with? With? Oof. Or against? Against Steven Gerrard. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Everyone asks me all the time, and the guy's like, as if if you think you... Doesn't break sweat, they can't. Mate, he fucking didn't against me. <laughs> <laughs> what a play. He's like, if you could build the perfect player, it's him. I didn't realise how big he was. Have you ever seen him like in... in yeah, but 6'1", 6'2". Oh, yeah. yeah. Strong, powerful... He'd kick you, score a goal. He just had everything. Mm -hmm. You know what I remember about him as well? He smelt lovely. <laughs> he did. He smelt lovely. Uh -huh. The after share he had on, but he smelt lovely. Proper player, great player, and obviously he's not a bad manager either. Yeah, he's done well, man. Been amazing. Him. For looking back in your life, just for your, what do you think of it so far? You're still young, but you're still only forty-one. But what do you get telling your story just now? How do you feel? For a long time, a long, long time, just be one big disappointment, how I looked at everything. But now, amazing. My life's been amazing. Yeah. I'm so blessed to have had so many amazing things and so many dark things to come through and to leave me in the position where I am now. As a 41-year-old, I feel like I'm, I've got, I've got, I've got it. I've got control of this amazing thing we call life. So yeah. yeah, I look back with amazing pride at what I've done. I, I quite often drive around where I'm from, where I was brought up, and um, the journey I've been on from there to where I've been all around the world doing what I'm doing fills me with immense pride. So it took a long time to get to where I am, but I look back at my life so far and I'm like, wow. Yeah, you're killing it, big lad. Yeah, good on you, brother. Because yeah. if you never went through all the dark times in your life, then you wouldn't be able to help the people you are now. Yeah, and that's the key to life. And I always say this shit, but the gift in life is giving. Yeah, no matter 100%. what it is, you helping other people, you also help yourself. Yeah, and I wish I could help everybody on the fucking planet. I wish I could reply to every message now, but I can't. But I do reply to most that I can when I've got the time. But 
just giving that people that, that bit of inspiration. But you've got to lead by the front and lead by example. Now, you've lived yeah. through the dark times. You've also lived through the glory times as well. You've had a lot of success. Million pounds signing on fees, British titles, fighting against all the odds, pushing yeah. through the racism, pushing through the hostile environment in your household and still here to tell the tale. Now, that tells you how much a character you are. Yeah. But fuck everybody else. Yeah. We're still going to battle. We've got that character. Listen, we can... Go and stay with monks for five years and come back and go on social media and still reply to people and call them wankers and cunts. Yeah. It's just ingrained into it's not a fucking, not to quit. Yeah. And that's the, the beauty of life. But Curtis, for anybody that's watching, maybe going through the struggle, brother, maybe it's battling with depression or not feeling good enough, what advice would you give for them? I think the, the advice that really hit on with me is to talk, you know, to really talk and, 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 and don't be ashamed of what situations you are in. And I know we're talking, we, we haven't dealt with therapy, but I'd definitely say reach out to professional people that can help, that have got experience in that um, in that field, because that's what they're there for. And the worst thing you can do is bottle everything up because a small problem becomes a big problem. And then like you said, there's so many people that feel there's no way out. And there always is, isn't there? There's always yeah. another way apart from taking your own life. Yeah. And that is obviously the, the, the mess it leaves behind as, as well. Is um is devastating for so many families out there, but I'd say talk and things are never as bad as how you feel, are they? Mm -hmm. Things are never quite as bad as what you feel, and tomorrow's always a new day. But reach out one hundred percent and and talk to people, especially men. And obviously women d suffer as well, but m men, I, it, it breaks my heart when I put social media on and see like the, the footballer the other week, you know that that had um, that taken his own life. It's uh. It's really sad, isn't it? It's heartbreaking, yeah. really. So we need to, as men, we need to look out for each other. We need to, um, we need to drop the the ego a little bit and not be scared to reach out. Yeah, but the beauty of life, people can change and make choices, and you are in control of your life. If you are feeling depressed or in a dark place, if you are under eating, over eating, not fit enough, battling with addictions, yeah, in prison just now, you can make changes in your life. One person that, when I was having a really, really bad time, that I reached out to was Leon McKenzie. I just sent him a message on um, on Twitter. I was going through like a really, really tough, probably with the darkest points that I've been. And I've not spoke to Leon for ages. And I know he's he does quite a lot with it, uh, with mental health. And I sent him a direct message on Twitter just saying, have you got a number I can contact you on, mate? And uh, and I just reached out to him and said, listen, I'm, I'm in a bad way here, mate. Do, uh, could you help me in any way? So he sent me over loads of contacts to speak to. The PFA were fantastic. Um, gave me 12, I think it's 12 free, um, free sessions um, with with somebody. And uh, and that was a big help. And luckily, some for some reason, I don't know why I reached out to Leon. I think I might have seen something on Twitter. This was a good few years back now. But luckily he was there. And I knew that if I did, he would be able to help. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, even when people aren't contacting you and they're doing good things, sometimes just drop them a message because there is that help out there. Yeah. And sometimes everyone's like, you know, saying, you know, to, to reach out. Sometimes you've got to reach in as well. You understand? Sometimes yeah. you've got to reach in and ask people, you know, are you okay? And Leon McKenzie was uh, was brilliant for me. And I played football with Leon, but outside of that, I would, we're, not, we're not like buddies. He's a friend, but we haven't had like a deep relationship. We just played football together, really. Mm -hmm. um, but Leon was great for me and put me on the right path to um, to dealing with a lot of issues. Yeah, um, yeah. It took me a while, but I'm I'm here yeah, now. No, you got a yeah. smile on your face, brother. That's the yeah. main thing. But it just shows you that that one message to even a complete stranger yeah. to reach out can change your whole outcome in life because it's just about getting help no matter how successful you are, no matter how much money you've got, no matter if you stop drinking, stop taking, stop taking, whatever the fuck it is, yeah. you can make changes and still battle. Yeah. It's just cult life. It's yeah. just pushing through it, keep swimming against the tide and never fucking sink. You got Never it. sink, keep going. But Curtis, so listen I'm, brother, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I think you've had mate. a phenomenal career. And Thank I look you. forward to what you see. And I've retired now. Podcast done. <laughs> I've gone out. Unless the, you come on for a part two, yeah, brother. I've gone out at the top. <laughs> <laughs> listen, top fascinating man. guy, mate. And listen, God bless you for the future. Cheers, buddy. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.